I'm Brian. Uh, I work on the security team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about how to keep your MediaWiki install secure. Um, particularly, I'm kind of aiming at the MediaWiki specific stuff for people who maybe aren't that familiar with hosting a MediaWiki install. Um, yeah. Ooh, how do I? That did not go to the next slide. Okay, so some basic non MediaWiki things, which I'm only going to talk about briefly because I want to focus on MediaWiki. Um, but, you know, the most important thing to keeping stuff secure is always updating your software when it has security vulnerabilities. Um, this is, you know, everything from your web server, PHP, and also MediaWiki and extensions. It's very important to always keep things up to date because um, that's how most of the time if there's a security vulnerability and it's well known, it probably has an update. Um, other things, you should follow the standard best practices. Uh, don't run your web server as root, etc. cetera. Uh, TLS is nice, you know. Sort of thing. Um, okay, so on to MediaWiki. One of the most important things to do is make sure like stuff that doesn't need to talk to the internet is isolated from the internet. There's no reason for your database server to be accessible from everywhere on the internet. Um, and similar things. A particularly important one is things like memcache and Elasticsearch if you use those because by default those don't implement any sort of authorization scheme. So they allow anyone anywhere on the internet to just access them. With memcache, often in the config, there's the dash L option to limit it to a specific IP address to listen to. But if you don't specify that, then it listens to the entire internet. If you're following tech news recently, there was a whole bunch of denial of service attacks that leveraged memcache being open to the entire internet web. So it's very important to lock it down because your memcache probably has sensitive data in it. If you're a private wiki, it probably has copies of the browser cache in it, which would have the contents of the page. If you don't lock it down, then anyone on the internet can see it. Even worse is potentially they could write to memcache, and if they find a PHP serialization vulnerability in MediaWiki, um, they could potentially get remote code execution out of that. So it's very important to make sure memcache is not accessible from the internet. Similarly, Elasticsearch by default doesn't have any sort of authorization mechanism, so you should make sure that the entire internet can't connect to your Elasticsearch instance. Um, depending on config, sometimes that can be very serious if you have certain dynamic script options um, set up. You can even run remote code by accessing Elastic Cache, although I don't believe that's enabled by default. Anyways, it's important to firewall your stuff. Brian, can I ask a question there on the Elasticsearch? Yeah, um, everyone feel free to just kind of interrupt me if you have questions. On Elasticsearch, do you know like um, the Elasticsearch plugin called uh, Head, which you know Elasticsearch is moving off plugins anyway, but um, does that expose the service? And if it does, if if plugins might expose Elasticsearch, can you would limiting like uh, post, put, delete? those methods, would that, would that secure it or? Um, so I'm not really familiar enough with Elasticsearch to give a good answer to that. Um, I imagine plugins have a lot of power and they can potentially expose um, stuff. In general, there's, from what I know of Elasticsearch, there's the REST interface to basically do all the things you do to delete documents and whatever. And in general, that's not something you'd want to expose, right? Uh, I don't know, usually head is supposed to be an idempotent uh, method that can't delete things. That's, that's the name of the plugin, actually. Oh, the name it's, of the plugin. It's like a visualization head end. Um, yeah, so I, I don't partic I'm not particularly familiar with that plugin, so I don't really know what it exposes. But as a general rule, I would recommend not having Elasticsearch exposed at all. Um, 
hope that. Uh, all righty. Um, so onwards to file system permission. When you're setting up your wiki, in general, uh, you want to set up the file system permissions so that, for example, uh, local settings.php isn't world readable so that every process in your computer can see your database password. Um, which, especially if you're on a shared host, but just in general, it's good practice, even if you're the only one on that host. Uh, one particular thing that can vastly improve security is making sure that PHP can't write to anywhere where PHP files are served. It's sort of like the separating write versus execution, kind of. Um, there's, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that basically revolve around somehow the user was able to create a file on the file system and choose the file name. For example, if you have an SQL injection and your SQL user has file rights in MySQL, that means they can basically create, they can add to the SQL query uh, into out file and then can write to an arbitrary file. So a very common way of exploiting that is to have the MySQL user write the results of the SQL query to a file that ends in .php in the place where it's served by the web server and thus getting code execution. So making sure that your uh, file system is set up so that PHP and other users that don't need to can't write to anywhere and don't own any of the file system where the PHP is served. Except obviously the images directory needs to be writable by the web server because when you upload images, users need to be able to actually upload images. Um, but for that, in order to lock it down, it's very important to disable PHP and other server-side scripting mm -hmm. languages in the images directory. Um, oh, and another one to also make sure is if you use the cache directory in MediaWiki, like WG use cache directory or something, not enabled by default, but if you do use it, it should be a non-web accessible directory. Um, image uploads. Also an important thing to be careful about. So there's the obvious advice of, unless you really know what you're doing, disabling MediaWiki's image upload filtering features is probably a really bad idea. Um, I guess that kind of goes without saying, right? Uh, for best security, it's best to use an entirely separate domain for your user uploaded files. That way, if a user figures out how to get around the filters that prevent XSS things in image uploads and prevent people from uploading random HTML with JavaScript. If they find a bypass, they can't really do anything with it because it's on a separate domain. Um, subdomain, if you can't do a full separate domain, subdomains are also good, not quite as good because cookies can still be sent. Um, often that can be exploited when combined with uh, user JavaScript, but nonetheless, it's much better than directly on the same domain. Um, and as I mentioned in the last slide, always disable PHP in your upload directory in case a user figures out how to upload a file with PHP in it, which MediaWiki should prevent, but like that's such a serious thing, you should prevent it on multiple levels. Uh, site JavaScript is also uh, a place where you might have major security concerns. So site JavaScript is a feature of MediaWiki where users can edit the page MediaWiki colon commons.js, right? And they can add arbitrary JavaScript to the site to customize it, which is great. You can do cool things. Um, basically anything you want. You should see what some of the people on English Wikipedia do in their custom JavaScript. It's crazy. And it provides a lot of stuff, but it also means that basically any administrator can add arbitrary JavaScript. If you can add arbitrary JavaScript, you can essentially take over an arbitrary account because the JavaScript controls the browser. So you should consider carefully who you give the rights to, um, to edit this JavaScript. So you don't want to give rights to people you don't trust because they could basically take over their accounts, redirect your site to whatever embarrassing thing would be bad if they redirected your site to. They can, um, as was rec recently,
happen to some poor people. Uh, they could install like a crypto miner uh, JavaScript thing. You know, like possibilities are endless. So it's important to consider the risks before allowing users to edit JavaScript. I'm not saying not to do it, but like be aware of the risks. Other things like gadgets, uh, personal JS, um, also has similar concerns. Um, last of all, the widgets extension, which how many of you use the widgets extension? Probably quite a lot. Yeah, it's a popular extension. And it gives you a lot of flexibility and freedom. You can do very cool things with it, but also gives you enough rope to hang yourself, as the saying goes. Particularly when a widget has parameters, you have to be very careful that you escape the parameter correctly. And in practice, from when I've reviewed other widgets, I would say, like, I don't know, one out of every two, maybe one out of every three, screw that up somehow. Um, so be careful when making your own widgets. And if you take a widget from someone else, make sure you check that parameters are sanitized correctly, because people screw it up like all the time. Um. Okay, so read restrictions. Uh, we've already heard a little bit about uh, in the last couple talks ago about using Semantic Media Wiki to semi-enforce read restrictions in a soft way. Um, in general, MediaWiki is good at doing something where everybody can view the wiki. It's good at nobody but logged in users can do the wiki. It's very bad at complex access control for reading. Um, generally, MediaWiki is not designed with this use case in mind, so most extensions that try and provide it end up either being slightly hacky or they do it without really consulting, you know, without core developers being aware of what they're doing. And that's not a good thing when it comes to an access control mechanism. Um, so yeah, you have to also verify other extensions, like maybe your read restriction extension is perfect and then you install semantic media wiki and special ask doesn't respect it. And then, well, then you get in around the read restrictions. Another common cause with re of problems with read restrictions is cache pollution issues, which is one, well, very similar to what we heard earlier about the guy who was implementing it with concepts in Semantic Media Wiki. In a similar note, for example, uh, RSS feeds of special recent changes exist. That gives you a list of the recent articles that were changed with a diff. Um, a common issue is many read restriction, complex read restriction extensions do not restrict that page and then that page can get cached so it will show for one user what it shows for the next user and then that way people can get around the read restrictions by first convincing a privileged user to look at the RSS feed and then loading the RSS feed again after that. Um, yeah, so the most secure way is if you're doing a private wiki is probably have it all private with a couple whitelisted pages. The big thing that problems start to happen is when some of the users who aren't allowed to see all pages also are allowed to edit some of the pages. Usually that's where problems happen. Um, if your wiki contains really sensitive information, I'd recommend using an entirely separate access control mechanism before even getting to the wiki. Like, you know, like HTTP basic auth type thing or some other uh, platform that prevents, where MediaWiki isn't even involved with getting access to it. Um. So choosing extensions. This is also where your wiki is likely to run into security problems if you're going to have some. Extensions are awesome. They can do almost anything, but with as, as Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and extensions vary widely in quality. You've got like some extensions which are developed by large teams who are excellent programmers and maybe security experts. And then you've got this other extension that like some guy pasted into a paste bin 10 years ago and you're copying it out of a wiki 
and it's not good. So the other problem is it's very hard to determine if an extension is secure unless you are like a security expert and audit it, right? Um, the best approach is you can look at what, where the extensions are used, like if it's used on a major site like say Wikimedia, that probably means some people have looked at it and checked, right? Um, but you know, not always different sites have different policies around that, but probably means people have looked at it if it's popular. Similarly, if it's by a well-known author who's been around for a while and still maintaining it, or even better if it's maintained by a team, team of people, that's a good sign versus like someone's one-off project from seven years ago. That's usually a bad sign. But like those are vague things to look for and there's no guarantees. Um, now, one to plug my own thing, but um, one thing we're working on now is a static analysis tool called Fan Taint Check. Um, I didn't choose that name, uh, <laughs> but I choose the stupider name, and so it got renamed to this. Uh, naming things is hard. Uh, at least it wasn't called like Flow. Um, anyway, so it's a tool that uh, checks for some common security issues and extensions. It's very experimental. Uh, it's new. Uh, it ha it has a lot of things it can't detect, and it also has things that will confuse it and give it false positives. Um, but uh, I don't really think there's very many alternatives, uh, so there's that. Um, and it has some obnoxious dependencies to make it run, which will hopefully change in the future. But it is a tool that you can use to run extensions through, and it gives you a list of possible issues which you could look at, and better than nothing, right? Um, I'll show you an example. Okay, so interactive time. Who can tell me what's wrong with this code? There's two problems. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yes, so this here on line six, that is an SQL injection. If the name, which comes directly from the URL, yeah, and the next line is a cross-site scripting vulnerability for the same thing. So in the first line, if, your user if the person supplied a username that had like an apostrophe in it, then they could do something like apostrophe into out file and then a name of a file with .php at the end with delimiter and some PHP code. And if the SQL user had f the file permission, which your SQL user definitely should not, then that would be remote code execution. Um, but even without that, there's a variety of things you can do with SQL injection. Uh, you can often extract other secrets from the database, maybe the user's hashed password, email addresses, etc. cetera. Um, so that's bad. And then the second thing is, as was pointed out, um, is the line seven where we directly in output HTML, where we say the user's name, which again, you can, someone inserts and puts their name as uh, less than sign script, angle bracket, some JavaScript that does evil stuff, right? Um, so yeah, so these are bad. So with this tool, it can detect these things. When you run the tool, you get this results where it tells you that on line six, there's an SQL injection uh, in argument three and it tells you it's probably caused by line four, which is where the variable was taken from the URL. Well, the line where it's caused by is kind of vague and often doesn't actually work, but uh, it can be helpful to track down. So it, it's an XTL engine, and then it says there's a second is issue where cross-site scripting on line seven, and that it's contained in the, argument, in the first argument, um, and it's caused by either this line 2,367 output page, which who knows what that is, probably where out.addHTML actually outputs to the HTML, or it's also caused by line four, which is where we got the name field from the URL, which is just to look back. That was line four where we get it, the evil value, and this is where we use it in the SQL, this is where we use it in the HTML. Um, 
Let's see. And that was basically what I wanted to cover. Um, yeah, so do people have questions about security, about any of this, or security, or really anything? Yeah? Uh, do we have a microphone for the back? <laughs> So for um, extensions, usually one of the first things I check is just um, if it's stable or unmaintained or whatever, but that's kind of just self-reported. Yeah, any, not consistently self-reported. And self -reported. not consistent, right, yeah. So is there any thought about having, you know, maybe a curated list or something where someone trusted goes through and kind of audits some of the most used or most available extensions? Um, there's been people who talk about it like not seriously. Um, but kind of like spitball, like, wouldn't that be cool? Oh, yeah, who should do that? Oh, not me. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, it'd be nice to kind of, like, rate the extensions, not just on security, but on a variety of factors, um, and more generally manage extensions better. Another issue is right now it's very hard to tell if your extension is up to date on security issues. Like with MediaWiki, it's very easy to tell if you're on the latest version could subscribe to MediaWiki dash announce, which if you're not, I suggest, and you maintain a MediaWiki extension install, I seriously suggest you do, which gives you an email when there's a new security release. For extensions, who knows? Some people email MediaWiki dash L when there's a new version of their extension that's security relevant. Some people don't. And MediaWiki dash L is also full of unrelated emails to that. And there's no central list of what's vulnerable. So yeah, something, one thing is that like, Extensions, there's a list of like, say, extensions installed in Wikimedia, which does confer sort of a quality thing in that Wikimedia mostly doesn't install totally terrible extensions. But like, you know, there are exceptions. Um, <laughs> if it's installed in Wikimedia and was installed like prior to about 2005, it's probably kind of terrible. Um, and there's plenty of extensions MediaWiki doesn't install for other reasons, right? So yeah, it'd be nice, but there's nothing really currently. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned the gadgets, and mm -hmm. I noticed yesterday that there are a ton of gadgets on MediaWiki.org, uh, or yeah. I should say Wikipedia.org. Uh, so are those gadgets um, kind of you know, approved and reviewed at all? Or? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, because this has come up quite a bit recently, actually. Um, so each language Wikipedia is responsible for maintaining their own site JavaScript and gadgets. Some places like English Wikipedia do implement some quality controls. I don't know how sophisticated those are. Other, like, on the other hand, other languages, if you go to small African language Wikipedia, there are almost certainly no quality controls there. Um, and like even on a major site like say Commons, I believe the quality control is like, does this look remotely sane? Okay, that's good enough. Um, so a little bit, not really. In terms of Wikimedia Foundation, we don't generally review them. Occasionally we hear about something bad and we may step in if there's something really bad, but mostly we don't audit them. There are other questions? Yarn? Could a security feed uh, check like that, what was it, fan something? Yeah. Fan. Could that potentially be integrated directly into MediaWiki? Um, or well, into, yeah, I guess into Jenkins, it, I guess, is another it, option. Yeah. So. As a matter of fact, actually, we're, we have experimental support for it in Jenkins. It's running and non voting on a on about 10 MediaWiki extensions currently. Uh, the one is bundled with MediaWiki and the default installer, which is a weird group of extensions, some of which nobody likes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, all those are currently experimentally done. If you submit a patch to Garrett, if you write a Garrett comment that says check experimental, it should run the test. Um, there are some like, it also depends on how effective the thing is, depends on your coding style a little bit. Um, it's 
can better understand certain coding styles than others. Um, generally, it works with MediaWiki core's coding style very well. So if you're doing other things, it might get confused and start giving false positives. It's still very much a work in progress, but yeah, that's the, that's the long-term plan. This is definitely supposed to be integrated into Jenkins. Um, other questions? I would just make one quick comment that you mentioned the images directory and stuff and the default, as far as I know, like the default image directory set up, uh, it's all protected on your Apache server with the HT access rules that get dropped in there with the readme that says, you know, like don't, don't, don't mess with this. Um, I'm not sure if the PHP engine is disabled in those things. There's, there's an HT access uh, for IE6 to prevent a weird vulnerability in Internet Explorer 6, which isn't very relevant anymore because, like, you know, Internet Explorer 6. I'm not sure if that HT access also disables PHP engine or not. Um, and also, it depends on how you have, like, that doesn't help you if you're using Nginx or IIS or whatever web server have you, right? Um. I have one. Yeah. I have one other comment, uh, just that I thought, you know, a few months ago, that not making uh, the directories writable by the web user was, that was just given practice. And then I came across this client and they had, I was like, it was all owned by www.data. I was like, why are you doing this? And just, anyway, they, I, I corrected them. Slap their hand. <laughs> yeah. Um, other questions? Doesn't necessarily have to be about this. I could do a little dance. Um, uh, Cindy? Actually, a sort of more of a little story, and this is like live because it's happening right now. Um, I'm actually chatting with somebody who. Um, I used to work with at MITRE. He's listening now. Hi, Kevin. Um, <laughs> so they're actually un undergoing a re-review um, of all of our um, external-facing wikis, and there they do a full review where everything gets completely pen-tested and code-reviewed, which is really nice because it has shown up um, in the past some vulnerabilities that have since been patched. Um, yay. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. Actually, um, equal info, right? Pardon me? The info action, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we found the info action cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, so at any rate, they're going through, they have to do a periodic re-review, which is fabulous. And, uh, and the InfoSec team there is tremendous, and we really enjoy working with them. Um, and actually, it's really cool when they find things, because you know then that they've really done their job, and they're really looking at it, and you feel better and more secure about the stuff. So one of the interesting things about going through the review now is that um, we we keep a few wikis, as I said the other day, you know, I, I pretty much record everything in a wiki somewhere. And um, so we created a couple wikis. Um, one's a planning wiki, which is sort of basic, basically a task management one. And then another one is we call our process wiki. And we use it to manage our wiki infrastructure. I, I'm sorry, I keep saying we. Just, you know, <laughs> dial that. That's Cindy in 2016. Um, at any rate, so we created a process wiki, and every time we needed to do an upgrade either to, um, to clone a wiki or, you know, to make any changes to our wiki infrastructure, and most importantly, any time we wanted to, um, to stage or um, promote to production a new extension or a new version of an existing wiki, we would add an entry into our process wiki showing you know, the request and it would track the request through um, testing, staging, um, and promotion to production, including the git hash of the particular um, version of the extension that we were putting. And they're now going through this process of the re-review and they wanna know what code they need to look at that's um, changed since the review the last time we did it. And um, Kevin was able to go back through the process wiki and query. It's a semantic, no, actually, I think that one's a cargo wiki, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he was able to go back and query and for a particular date range, see 
what was the status of all the extensions the last time that we pulled the code and what is it now and be able to actually do some real targeted looking at what really needs to be the highest level focus of the review. So um, process works <laughs> and um, you know it, it's sort of a you know I guess we're going to be talking a little bit about best practices later today and tomorrow so um, that's something that you know really has helped us it's a good win. It's always awesome to hear when other people who use MediaWiki installs are doing a security auditing of their extensions. Because um, there's a lot of extensions, and Wikimedia does audit extensions that it uses, but there's a lot we don't use. And it's great when people improve the security of the ecosystem. Yeah, I think we use something like 80, and, and, he, and Kevin just confirmed, yes, Cargo. But um, yeah, I think we have something like 80 Wiki, eight, eight extensions loaded. I, I guess I should also mention, in the event you ever do find a security vulnerability in MediaWiki, uh, email security at wikimedia.org. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, or an extension, if it's not a Wikimedia extension, we'll forward the report to the author of the extension. All right, then. I guess that's, unless anyone else has any qu other questions or comments. All right.